All right. Um, okay, well, let's just introduce ourselves uh, real quick. And we'll all be sharing. Um, Marta's going to start off with a little bit about unschooling, what it is in the history of it. So why don't you introduce yourself first, Marta? Hi, my name is Marta Weaver. Um, I'm a homeschool mom of seven, six of those being graduated. Um, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. So I'm ex really excited to be here today to share something important to me. And when did you start homeschooling? We've been homeschooling since the mid nineties. So, yeah. So uh, same with me, really, we started, uh, started in 1991. And um, this was always our basic philosophy too, you know, is just to let our kids learn what they wanted to learn. And then you're gonna see how you put in the structure and unstructure. But, um, you know, Marta said she's already graduated six of her seven. That is awesome. I had mm -hmm. four, which are all graduated. And, you know, this, I, I just wanted my kids to love learning. You know, that was the main thing. I didn't want them to hate school when they got out of school like I did and not want to go to college for a while. So my oldest um, son actually did go to the Air Force Academy and just aced it. You know, so we all know that this kind of learning absolutely works, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then what about you, Phyllis? Um, I'm Phyllis Lero. I'm one of the high school counselors at Home Life Academy. And I um, was homeschool mom for about 17 years. We homeschooled from about 1998. And I graduated my last one in 2015. And so we, I had three homeschool graduates from Home Life Academy. And... Um, uh, it's just was a wonderful experience and um, love what we're talking about today. So I'm excited. Yeah, and I'm excited that so many people we have like by now, who knows, close to 400, I think, people that registered. So this is something that, um, you know, I am very glad to see an interest in this again. So Marta? Why don't you go ahead and introduce us to unschooling and what it is we're talking about today. Wonderful. Sorry, I'm getting there, guys. All right. Um, so I wanted to start out with a few pictures to get us in the right mindset for today. Um, so just, I'm not even really going to say anything. I just want you to look at a few of those pictures. And I hope those pictures um, stir your heart and your mind and get you ready to, to talk a bit about homeschooling. I mean, unschooling, which is part of homeschooling. Um, I also wanted to uh, start, and these words come from me, but I... I I think it's important for those of us who homeschool for Christian reasons that we are often reminding ourselves that um, to be wise and, and thoughtful about the worldview that um, a particular um, path might take us down. And um, I love unschooling, but there is an element of unschooling that is not necessarily from a Christian worldview. And so I just throw that caution out. That comes just from me, but um, I just wanted to share that at the beginning. These words are words that you see on the screen now that we talk about all the time when we talk about homeschooling in general. This is probably the homeschooling Bible verse, but I think it just fits so beautifully with unschooling. And I wanted to start by reading it. It comes from Deuteronomy 11, 18 and 19. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and your minds. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, and that's uh, the idea with unschooling. It's a 24 seven kind of way of life. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about like, like Lonnie said about the history. And so some of the pioneers that we should know, I think, um, Unschooling has really seen that, uh, homeschooling in general has seen a real pendulum swing over the years. Back in the day, partly just by necessity, many homeschoolers would fit in the category 
closer to unschooling because we didn't have so many options or online classes or uh, curriculum that were printed. There was very few. And so people were doing a lot of things from their own home and from the library. And I think there, over the years, so many options have come out and we've stepped a little bit away from that. And we're beginning to see the pendulum swing back. Um, there's so much joy in, in this style of homeschooling. And I don't say that to uh, belittle any other style because other styles work for certain families, but um, there is a lot of truth to uh, the fact that in uh, unschooling and relaxed homeschooling, we, we really embrace the joy of families and children and, and all that God has given us. So these are probably two big pioneers that come to my mind when I think of unschooling. Many of you heard, have heard of John Holt. He was a school teacher who had gone to Yale. His degree was not in education, but um, he taught in some exclusive type private schools for about six or eight years, I think, and became very disillusioned with education. And so he coined the term unschooling back in the 70s. Um, he said that children learn from everything they see, which that's awesome, but it's a little bit scary too, but it's a good thing to keep in our minds. And he said what is most important and valuable about the home, home as the base for children's growth into the world is not that it is better than the school, um, but that it is not a school at all. So those are just some, some of the kind of thoughts that he had. He really uh, led the movement for a while there and... Um, I would say one thing about him is that he was very child centric. Uh, the, the child was the center of, of the picture of education. And so that is really goes along with unschooling. Probably one of his most famous books is under his, his picture there is How Children Learn. You may have already come across that in your uh, studies yourself and research. Next to him, we have the Moores, Dorothy and Raymond Moore. I love them. Um, Dr. Moore was a PhD in education and she had a master's level degree in education. And um, Dr. Moore was in the mid century, the mid 1900s. He began to be somebody who spoke out in academia to say there's a different way. And a big part of what he shared with us was well, it, it, one of his most famous books is um, Later Better is Better Than Early. And um, so, or better late than early. Um, he really, I would say he was very family centric. He was very concerned with the relationship between the child and the parent. And he saw the value of the student being with their parents. So, um, and he also, one thing, huge blessing for those of you who have boys, he understood in a very unique way that boys often are on a different timetable than a specific timetable that other people might lay out. And if you're a mom of a boy and you've ever been down that path, you know how precious that really can be to a mom's heart. Um, I had a son who really didn't become a, a hardly a reader and definitely not a good reader until he was really 10 or so. And uh, even one time in VBS, the teacher embarrassed him and then came to me and shamed me that he didn't read better and that I was neglecting that. And I want to tell you that that kid is 24 now, and he's the only person I know personally who's read War and Peace and can tell you what it's about. I can't. <laughs> he reads voraciously, he loves to read, and much of my encouragement at that time came from the Moors. So if you're walking that path, um, children will learn, learn to read, and Dr. Moore and, uh, and his wife will encourage you in that way. I'll read a quote from him also. He said, um, in speaking of homeschooling, uh, it's a recipe for genius. More of family, less of school, more of parents and less of peers, more creative freedom and less formal lessons. And when you, uh, when you go down the path of uh, making a choice to be an unschooler or a relaxed schooler, you may take some pushback from family, from neighbors, from even other homeschoolers who say, oh, that's not, that's not really a thing or you're neglecting or something like that. But Dr. Moore was a PhD, very well respected in academia and um, kind of led a movement where others followed him. So you do have valuable scientific um, research and 
things to back you up. So don't forget that. Um, Mary Hood is uh, someone who is really connected with what we call relaxed homeschoolers. And I bring this up because I think there's one of my slides we're going to get to here in a minute talks about the spectrum. But relaxed homeschooling is a little different than unschooling. And the difference is that in relaxed homeschooling, there is um, the parent does take a little bit more of a position of decisions in what the student might learn. So, um, and, and people that are call themselves relaxed homeschoolers are fairly unique. Uh, it's not even sometimes discussed as a style, but because I identify that way, <laughs> I like to talk about it. So I share it with you. She wrote the book, The Enthusiastic Homeschooler, also very encouraging, and the book, um, The Joyful Homeschooler. So those are two good researchers sources for you. And she um, is no longer real active. Um, and she has a website, but I, I went on it recently and, and it, she's on a hiatus. So I'm not sure if there is a lot of new stuff from her. Both John Holt and Dr. Moore are no longer with us or, or Dorothy uh, Moore, but Mary is, is still around. Then some other current voices, and there are a lot of voices for unschooling today. I really... Um, I'm impressed by that. Um, so I share a couple people that you could you could go and hear them speak live today. Uh, Judy Arnaud, who um, is from Canada, and she also has quite a few books on parenting. For me, I don't necessarily agree with everything she says, especially her parenting things, but she does have a lot of good resources. Uh, her book, Unschooling to University, is encouraging if you have any kind of concern about Oh, what will happen to my child? She has some really beautiful stories about unschooled children who graduate and go on to very interesting and impactful lives. She often talks about her, uh, uh, she calls it her band of 30 or her something of 30. She has 30 students she's really followed. So it's interesting. And then Mary Griffith is one that I don't know a lot about, but Phyllis may talk about her more later. Um, also, she wrote the Unschooling Handbook. So um, those are just a few of the people. There's so many these days that you can uh, access and get. There's so much available to us to encourage us. But I don't want to forget the people that could probably teach us the most. And that's the kids who have graduated who have been unschooled. Uh, this young man, I've never met him. His name is Samuel Butler. But I came across his documentary, um, Life is a Look into the World of Unschooling. He's a kid. Uh, uh, he, this documentary he made in 2019, very interesting and a good insight from the kid side of it. Uh, and he takes you and interviews various homeschoolers, unschoolers, different types of families. So uh, that's a good resource as well. And don't forget, if you know families that have children older than yours who have been unschooled or who are unschooled, great resource. Don't ever... Um, Forget that. <laughs> books, 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 but don't forget <laughs> the people that are living it. Uh, this comes off ChristianUnschooling.com, and I believe this is Mary Griff from Mary Griffith, um, Phyllis. But this is just kind of a spectrum, and I think that this is helpful for us. Um, you can see on one very far end, we have the unschooler. We call that autonomous. All those unschooling terms are, are about student directed. And you can see then it shifts all the way back. To very school-based education. Uh, I'd say for us in, in the unschooling and relaxed schooling world, we probably fall in this kind of greenish-blue area. And we'll talk more about um, some of those things. I just kind of wanted to show you that spectrum and remind you, you may yourself be at one place on the spectrum this year and a different place three years from now. And uh, I think we, we all walk that as homeschoolers. But I think our overall philosophy often stays the same through our years of homeschooling. Um, just like anything else right now, there's a lot of words that go that float around when we people talk about unschooling. I think that phenomenon comes from our connectedness that we have um, together as people with the Internet and, and things like that. Um, so I just wanted to briefly kind of go over some words that we might hear today and words that are good to, to talk through. Um, on the top, you see styles on the, that side of the spectrum that we just looked at. Of course, homeschooling can be many things. Um, and uh, 
I don't remember who said it, but schooling is not so much where it happens, but how it happens. And so when we say homeschooling, it's not just about that place, but it's more about, it's not houseschooling, it's homeschooling, right? So it's, it's about that place where we gather and uh, there's love and there's connectedness to people who are really important in our lives and those things. Um, and unschoolers sometimes don't consider themselves uh, homeschoolers. They like to be separated from that, but, but some do. Um, they want to make sure that you know that they are not schooling some of them in a way that is traditional or typical, even as some homeschoolers might. So, uh, but basically, the idea of unschooling really is curiosity driven experiences provided to a child, delight led learning, and joy in learning to create a lifelong learner who sees the world as his classroom. Um, I, when I think of that, I think about times that I've been in educational experiences in my life, different educational programs. And often the sentiment of the class is when we get through with this, we'll be living. Um, you know, when we just get done with this section of this college program, or when we get done with this training for our job, oh, then, you know, then we can enjoy life. But really, even as adults, <laughs> We, we want to hope that we can encourage a love of learning and that learning is a joyful uh, gift from God um, and that that curiosity wouldn't die. Um, I, I already talked a little bit about relaxed homeschooling. De-schooling, big, big word right now, I think. It didn't used to be around, but it's definitely out there now. And you guys probably are familiar with it. But just briefly, it's that idea of that transition from a traditional type school to a more uh, homeschool, unschool, or relaxed schooling situation. Um, some people say for every year that you've been in, your child's been in a traditional school, you should try to de-school. If you've got a kid in high school, that's going to be a little rough, but uh, it's a, it, some people try to do that. And it's just that idea of just really taking time to not have pressures of schooling, just letting things be as they are, kind of like summertime, even if it's in July, I mean, December, you're just not holding yourself to that list. And it really can be beneficial. Um, I was in a large co-op for some number of years and the leader of the co-op, I would hear her frequently give advice to new homeschoolers or, and don't forget this guys, homeschoolers who had hit a wall and who were struggling. Sometimes you gotta de-school then too. Um, and she would say, Go to the library, pick out three books, sit on your couch for a week with your kids and read those books. Let your kids pick the books. Um, and don't, don't let those thoughts, it's hard, but don't let those thoughts of, oh, we're going to get behind in math or we're going to, gaps in learning will happen no matter how your student is educated. I hear homeschool moms all the time who were public schooled as a child say things like, I never learned that in school. And I'm thinking to myself, my kids probably say that too. We can't, we can't fill every gap. So it's okay to take that time to step back and um, focus on other things. And you may need that yourself. Even as an unschooler, you might need to get away from what you've been doing and de-school. And there's not a lot of places in life where you can do that. If you have a job, you probably can't say, hey, guys, I just need a week off and I'm just going to take it. Or if you have a, maybe a chronic illness in your family, you don't say, well, we're just going to forget about. But this is a place where you do have that and you, you can make that choice. So, hey, make use of it. That's what I think anyway. Um, then we'll move down a little bit. Um, we're going to look at the student and the uh, parent here. So. As we've already said with unschooling, we're talking student-led learning. We often call it uh, delight-led learning or interest-led learning, meaning that the child helps you to see what they are interested in learning. For a three-year-old, that may be Play-Doh. For a 17-year-old, that may be hunting. That may be drawing. That may be Latin. <laughs> Don't forget, sometimes they choose very academic things as well. Um, and as the parent you're more should be more thinking of yourself as a facilitator a mentor a guide 
and not really so much as a teacher. Um, so those are some of the terms that, that fly around for, for the parent in that situation. And then just real quickly, um, a big thing with home, with unschooling is that motivation. What are the motivators that make you learn? What are the motivators that make your child learn? And there's really three big areas. One is interest. Um, if you have a, a, a kid who just loves rocks, you don't have to teach them about rocks. They will suddenly have this huge collection of rocks and they want to check out books from the library about rocks. That's their motivation. They're interested in it. Sometimes it's, um, it's just fun and that's their motivator. And don't be afraid because sometimes things that are fun are useful. <laughs> Maybe they love to learn other languages because it's fun. It's also very useful. And then the other one is, is a need. You may have a child who, um, uh, let's say a parent doesn't cook very well and that child likes good food. That may be their motivator to learn to cook. They may learn uh, if they have a sickness, a chronic sickness, they may have a motivation, not because it's fun or enjoyable, but it's of, out of a need to learn about that. Um, words that you will very often hear in the unschooling world are life because learning is life, curiosity. Um, and we want, we want them to graduate and want to keep learning. We want them to love learning. And so we try to create for them an atmosphere that encourages that. Delight and joy are a big part of it as well. And that last word in the bottom in the middle is also a word that whether you do it and you know that word or you don't, it, it's just the idea. Strewing is um, a term that means that in your unschool, being um, your home, your neighborhood, your church, the places you go, you are Again, remember, you're that facilitator. You are providing for your child, your student, opportunities to interact with things where they will learn. Maybe it's wood and hammer and nails because you think maybe they might be interested in that or they flat out told you they want that. It may be lots and lots of books. It may be um, access to a video, whether it's online or, or videos that you purchased. It may be, and don't discount this, people. You may invite people to your home that can tell them interesting stories about experiences they've had or things they know, skills they have. And you may find a child who says, I would really like to learn more about locksmithing after we had dinner with Mr. So-and-so. So you're providing by strewing, you're providing those things that when the interest is there, they are there and they can uh, try to fill that curiosity. And it doesn't have to be expensive. So don't, don't always think of that. I saw one thing that said, um, all you need to unschool is a library card. And that's really pretty true. <laughs> you, you can, a library card and a lot of good thrift stores help too. But um, Outdoors. Dr. Raymond Moore was one who said, don't focus on toys, but focus on letting your child play in the mud or climbing trees or, you know, uh, interacting with other people. So it's not just things, but it's opportunities and experiences. Um, I think that's it for me. I, I hope that um, at least you've caught my heart for how much I love this topic. And I encourage every one of you, if you're considering it, or if you're already in, in the path and, and sometimes you're, it doesn't matter what kind of homeschooling we are doing. There are, there can be tough days, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but, but it is uh, such a beautiful way to live and to my children, my grown children are my favorite people in the world. They're super interesting and not because of me, but they just really are. And I think being school the way they were is a big part of that. And of course, the blessings from the Lord. This is my last slide. You might think, oh, well, that's probably a slide about kids, but it's not. It's a slide about parents. <laughs> and what I wanted to say is in the world of homeschooling, um, when you first come in, you kind of got to find your your lane or your people. And uh, so you, you may fit well with unschooling people because you 
have those same philosophies and ideas. You may not. You may fit in a, uh, a very much more stru- structured type of situation. But I want to say to you that there are very few purists in the homeschool community. Many um, families, now you see this picture, it's going to be a little bit difficult to find the true primary colors. I see a bit of green and maybe a little bit of yellow, but mostly I see mixtures. And that is often very true with homeschooling. You may be unschooling this year, last year, and the year before, and then you see a need to take a turn for a different path. And the beauty is that you have that freedom to do that. Um, And so my final words are, don't be afraid. Um, You, there's so much joy to be had. There are difficulties. This doesn't mean life will be perfect. Don't get me wrong, because I think we do put that thing out there. Oh, when you're not pushing, pushing your kids and you're letting them do their thing, you don't have trouble. That's not true. (laughs) You still have trouble in this world. There will be trouble, but um, it is a beautiful um, opportunity and path that God provides for us. So I will pass on to Lonnie. Okay. Um, That was great. Um, Okay. So you just about covered it all, Marta. (laughs) Awesome. But you know, um, at Home Life Academy, well, for those who don't know, David and April Parkerson um, actually started Home Life Academy um, online in 2003. And I started with them as their first high school counselor and Lynn was elementary. So it's just the two of us. And, um, And our philosophy everyone at Home Life Academy over the years has predominantly been this whole kind of an unschooling, eclectic approach to um, school. So, so that was really awesome. And I personally, I love the fact that so many homeschool moms these days who are brand new um, are interested in this more real life style of learning. So what I want to do is I want to just show you what we've got on our website, because so many times you have questions or, you know, you're wondering about something and you don't really think, oh, let me go to their website. But we have so much on here. And I will say, too, that we have just redone our website. We've actually launched kind of a a new website now that is a work in progress. And, um, and I want to say that I can't find everything on here myself, but we have a search bar. We have so much information, layers and layers. So I just want to introduce you to a little bit that uh, you may not know. So I'm going to screen share and just show you our Home Life Academy. Okay, so this is under the About Us tab. So we've got these tabs across the top of our website, and you're going to see this, you know, About Us Light the Fires. Now, that is one of David Parkerson's very favorite quotes from um, Yates in the beginning, but John Holt is the one who really talked about that education is all about lighting the fires rather than the filling of the pail. So in other words, I never wanted to just stuff my kids' heads full of facts because I knew they were going to forget those. You know, that's what the science shows. You put in all the facts, short-term memory, they're going to forget them. What's the point? So I wanted just more of a real learning and what and how you get that is you light the fire just like Marta was talking about, you know, you see a, you see a little spark of interest. And what do you do? You feed that just like you feed a fire, you know, and pretty soon, oh my goodness, you don't even know, um, you know, where that's going to go. With my son, uh, my oldest one that I said went to the Air Force Academy, I saw that little spark in his eyes from my Highlights magazine when he was five years old. And, you know, we weren't really doing curriculum 
that year, we were just, you know, reading books, going to the library, getting our little magazines. They loved Highlights magazines, um, playing in the dirt, like she said, all these things. And when we read an article in Highlights about Chuck Yeager, test pilot, his eyes lit up and he said, that's what I want to be. And I said, yep, that makes sense. You do like the most dangerous things, but I fed it. I just fed it. We went to air shows. We did paper airplanes, you know, all the way through high school. And he became a pilot before he graduated high school. He went to the Air Force Academy. He's a pilot. Uh, he's a major now in the Air Force. I don't really think he would have done that. Honestly, I don't. If we had not homeschooled and I saw that spark. So lighting the fires and feeding the fires is huge. So this is just a page to tell us, tell you a little bit about. There's David in April, Home Life Academy. Okay. And, um, and you know, if you can't find things, I want to confess on this new website, I can't find everything. So here's the search bar and I search. But here are some homeschool helps. You know, if you put that in the search bar, uh, you'll get a lot of things here on our website. And some of these things um, we have talked about and we're going to have links to and some not. One of our favorites and David and April's has always been, I saw an angel in the marble which is awesome, but you know, here's the Moors, here's all kinds of helps here that early on, we got these books, they were our resources. They taught us how to homeschool when we did not have a clue. And, and I will say this, talking about that spectrum that Marta was showing us, um, most of us and probably most of you, all we know is really school. You know, we know public and private school. So when we start homeschooling, I know I did, I modeled the classroom. No kidding. We did everything that schools do. And, and the ones that, you know, way back in the day when I was in school, you know, so we did the pledge. And I'm not going to say this was a bad thing. I think it was wonderful. We did the Pledge of Allegiance and we sang the songs, you know, My Country Tis of Thee. Um, we did the Bible reading. We did everything just like schools did. That was what I knew, you know. And then I ended up with the timeline down my hallway and people used to tease me when they came to my house. <laughs> They'd be like, oh my gosh, you know. And our, um, our dining room was our school room, you know, and it was the maps. It was the total classroom. But you know, something happened along the way. And that was that when my husband was home, you know, he would start saying, what are you doing today with the boys? Because our two boys were his helpers, you know, when he was at home. And I started realizing, you know, anything that I'm going to be doing with them is not as important as what their dad's going to be doing with them. So if you're home, you forget what we plan for school, but you do something with them. And so, you know, they learned all kinds of things working with dad. Um, you know, so again, it was that whole, uh, relaxed homeschooling where we were relaxed enough to say, mm, forget what I had planned for today. They're going to hang out with dad, you know, and learn things with that. And talking about, uh, you know, just kind of the philosophy of Home Life Academy and unschooling is if you put in a heart for learning, which I suggest you do this, it is David Parkerson's whole story here. A little bit of the history of homeschooling. And early on in the days, David would always do a workshop on the heart of homeschooling. But here it is on our website. Um, so really, really awesome. See, so here's some of the history of it. And um, so that's, I really suggest you read that. And, and then we have homeschooling quotes on our website. Again, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And you're going to see that is 
really what unschooling is all about. So a lot of our counselors here, we were asked some time ago for some of our favorite quotes. And so here's me and mm, I have a lot of favorite quotes. <laughs> Apparently I do. Um, so we have all of these that are again, gonna help you with that just overall philosophy. Now to start getting into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of what we've got is if you click on academics, which I go to this one a lot, my favorite tab, I have to say, and click on K through eighth grades, you're going to get um, just kind of the overall elementary middle school. And then you're going to get some wonderful ideas under everything counts. So again, this is, um, this is what we call unschooling. It is certainly not not schooling, which, you know, since I've been doing this for 30 years, um, I've seen where we started out like this and then we kind of got into, oh, it has to be textbooks. Um, so we as counselors at Home Life Academy, um, you know, most of what really stresses moms out is curriculum. They're always stressed out. Oh, do we have to finish this? Oh my gosh, we're behind. Oh, do we have to do um, pre-calculus? And you know, all these things, it's always about curriculum. So when you have this very relaxed approach, um, you're not so worried about the curriculum, but then of course you stress out about, are they gonna be prepared for college now if I take this relaxed approach? How are they going to you know, be prepared for ACTs and scholarships? Well, you know, all four of mine went to four year universities and they were all at the very top. Well, my one son not at the very top, but he's doing well. <laughs> You know, he's a captain in the Air Force in cyberspace warfare. And so, you know, he, he was my little bit different learner. And when you unschool, you can, you know, if you've got a child like my youngest daughter, who's very, very structured and very take charge and I want to do all this, then they can do anything that they want. And literally all I had to do with her is just kind of feed her books. You know, she learned to read on her own because she didn't want to do phonics. I said, okay, that's fine. You can learn without phonics. And she did. But these are just things that you can do. And I will guarantee you that your child is going to be prepared for whatever God has in store for them because they're going to love learning. They're going to have a real, what I call a real education as opposed to like a fake, just all from textbooks. That's kind of a fake education. We want our kids to really be doing it, not just reading about it, okay? And so this is the way they get that. And we have so many awesome um, things on our website that you can go to. So we've got all grade levels. Just want to show you. Um, what is that? Oh, here we go. So specifically, you can go to each grade level and we're going to have first through third. What are some ideas? What do they need for that age group? You know, you want to focus on the three R's basically, and then you just throw in anything else that they're interested in. Then we have samples. Now you might look at these samples and go, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm not even that structured, that's fine. Or you might look at this and say, uh, first grade, is it okay to do science and history? Well, since I ran a big science history co-op group for years, you know, I'm gonna say my kids did science and history every year and it was hands-on, it was all hands-on. But what did that teach them? That taught them that when they got to biology in high school, they aced the lab work you see what I mean? Because they had been doing labs through their little experiments every single year of their life. Uh, so we've had a lot of snow. I don't know about you, but a lot of us have had a lot of snow. And, um, you know, this reminds me of way back in the day when my kids were little, 
I had a very good friend. She was in our little homeschool group. It snowed and our snows generally melt by noon. You know, they don't usually last for a week like this one did. Um, so she called me up to see what we were doing. And I said, well, my kids are all out playing in the snow. And she goes, oh, uh oh, well, mine are still doing their work. They're not done with their schoolwork yet. So they can't go out. And I'm like, oh my goodness. By the time they finish with their schoolwork, it's going to be melted. Let them go out and play. Okay. <laughs> Which she did. <laughs> and so my kids would run in, change their clothes, which was soaking wet, but they were little. And my daughter that year was probably three or four, you know, and they're a couple of years apart. So what they were doing is they were going out to the lake and throwing things out into the lake and doing experiments on how heavy something had to be and how far they could throw it into the lake before it would sink. And they were like graphing this out in their minds because they would come in and tell me so excited. Oh my goodness, mom. Now, we, now we're throwing rocks and we're seeing how far they will go. You don't think this is real learning, but, but it was play because I did not assign it and I didn't give them a sheet they had to fill out. But this was, um, you know, this is a physical science experiment, okay? This is lab work they're doing. So it's really awesome when you just kind of turn kids loose. And for the most part, that's what I did with my kids. So this is uh, now fourth through sixth. We have so many things on our website, so many ideas. And it's going to keep you and give you that structure that you need where you're wondering, oh, but what about well, my sixth grader? Oh, what can they do? What's going to be too much? What's going to be too little? What are some ideas? Guess what? We've got that. And again, we've got the samples, just samples. Um, I'm going to take you to Apple Corps in just a few minutes, our grade reporting website, um, because this is your education plan. So at the beginning of every year, when you um, re-enroll, we're going to ask you for your education plan. And what that means is you're going to set up the new school year. Samuel is now a fifth grader. What is he going to be doing? Or what do you think he's going to be doing? Because it can change and you can go in and edit that. But, you know, we want to know, and you've got a real good record of it yourself. What are they going to be doing? Okay. And like I say, you don't have to stick with this, but we put this in here because it's kind of the basics. You know, the three R's, uh, PE, music, might be art for your student, might be history, might be science, might be astronomy, because <laughs> they're really into space and stars right now, okay? So very, very flexible. Uh, that's one thing about Home Life Academy, is that we're all about flexibility. Um, so then now, seventh and eighth grade is when we suggest that you start getting letter grades if you haven't already. But you don't have to in K through sixth grade. You don't even have to give them letter grades. You can put pass fail or you can put excellent, you know. Um, but seventh and eighth, you need to start thinking about giving grades, you know, because um, they're going to be in high school. And we also start in eighth grade on our website with a checklist for you. So we do this um, throughout high school as well. Uh, checklist, here we go. These are going to keep you right on target. Okay. Now it might seem that with our checklist, we're getting very structured, but we're teaching you because you do have to have a transcript in high school and transcripts are more structured. So how do we do that? Um, okay, so then under academics, this is, um, this is the place I go to all the time since I'm really the high school counselor. Um, so we've got a career assessment page where you can start having them take some of these tests and see what they're interested in. These are awesome. We have some options for special needs because going into this more structured, you may start thinking, 
I don't think my child is there yet because they are special needs. How am I going to do that? And Phyllis is going to be the one to help you with that. And that's one of the reasons we have her on this because she is um, working with all of our special needs and modified diplomas, which um, we have a page about that. So, you know, sample diploma. We have one diploma. And then we have a certificate of completion that um, just that is that's just for our special needs students who really can't do anything at, um, you know, not even modified classes. Um, so we can discuss that more. And if you ever have questions, you know, you can um, just contact Phyllis at the end. Um, Okay, so we have all these, all these things. Look at this that we've got on our website. Such a wealth of information that sometimes we counselors joke about the fact that almost every one of our questions is answered on our website. Um, not to say you don't have things you, you need to talk about, and that's what we do, but we do have a lot of information here. Um, under high school planning, which is one thing I wanna tell you here, we help your students, whether they are going for military academies, NCAA, but this right here, um, a short video, I love this woman, Julia lithcott Haynes, and we have her little short video on our website about finding the balance. Finding the balance kind of between structure and unstructure. So please, 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 this is how to raise successful kids without overparenting, but it all goes back and ties in with what we're talking about with unschooling and structure versus unstructure. And she is going to let you know what the number one thing is that you can do to raise successful kids. And it has nothing to do with curriculum classes or any of that, I just want to tell you. <laughs> so that is um, on our website, high school, and it's under the high school planning. Um, I don't need that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, let me move this, is on our website, this is where you log into your Home Life Academy account. All right, so I'm going to log in. Okay, this is my fake account. <laughs> and I'm going to pull up my pretend students here. And we'll go to Jackson. Because what I did for him was, this is from one of our actual students, our unschoolers. So you can choose the path, which we didn't go over the paths. I forgot about that. But on our website under high school planning, you can go down and look at all the paths that we've got. All right. Um, what is this gonna show? Okay, so what path are you going to choose for high school? You can choose the NCAA, the college four, which if you just don't know, just pick that one, you know, prepare them um, until you know differently. This is the college two two-year or technical schools or military, they have a little bit less stringent requirements generally than the four-year. We've got the life choice, which is what we're going to be talking about, that whole kind of unschooling. They, who knows where they may want to go. My kids, like I said, they all went to pretty rigorous four-year colleges. So I would have chosen this path, but yet predominantly unschooled, <laughs> you know, because it's relaxed, right? Uh, the modified, which I said is really the one that Phyllis can help out on, and then the certificate of completion, which there are really no uh, required courses or anything on that one. They're not going to get a regular diploma. So with Jackson doing uh, a life choice, okay, you can kind of look at his transcript, which we like you to be at. We like to be able to look at the transcript. Colleges do, military does, and kind of look at this kid and see his interest. So don't forget that in addition to the science and the history and math and English, 
that we want to see some, um, you know, some other things on here, even if it goes be a little bit beyond the basic requirement for electives. You know, so this student, well, you know, he did some traditional math. What was that? Because, you know, he had that very relaxed. Um, so he did, he was in a co-op. And then he used some Khan Academy to help out with, you know, um, he used some different books. Okay. Um, what else? He did his PE, basketball, swimming, ping pong, various sports. Doesn't look like he was on a team, right? But he did a lot of things. Co-op class, uh, took a class at the public school. And then I remember this one is, uh, okay, he got a credit in animal science herpetology. And so he used many books, videos. He had a pet gecko, chickens, ducks, keeps bees, makes honey. And this is what he did. He lived on a farm. It's what his family did. Um, so he did use some, you know, various books and, and videos. See, but this is a very student-led, interest-based learning philosophy, okay? And so then, you know, he did this, uh, what about math? Now, this student is not, I wouldn't say he's not good in math. I think he has a real head for math, but he never did any higher math. You know, um, this particular mom, her students are very smart. They're awesome whenever they work for a company because they're grown. This is the youngest. He's 18. Um, and her daughters, they rise to management positions wherever they are. They, they both went to college actually for a year and aced it and then decided the college really doesn't have what we want to learn. They very much grew up learning how to um how to research and how to learn anything they want to learn. And again, it, it kind of goes back to what Marta said, uh, this real learning, you don't know what God's got in store for them, but whatever it is, kids growing up with this philosophy, they know they can do it. They don't have any doubts about it. And they also, uh, they know where to find information. They're like, oh, I think I want to do this now. What do I need? Let me let me get it and let me learn it, you know? So this, this student's very hands-on. He did the chemistry of essential oils, <laughs> which some of us do essential oils as well. Uh, but you know, he um, you know, he used some books and then he did this very hands-on. So he used the chemistry of essential oils. Okay. Um, he did carpentry, he did history. You know, what did, what did he do there? Great courses, DVD, real books, documentaries. That's, you know, that's his history. He had work experience, started getting into the videography and photography. Um, oh, let's look, U.S. history. And history and English kind of go along together and they can overlap. So everything they're reading in English you can kind of go, okay, let's do American history the year that we do U.S. history for, you know, for the history. Let's do American history for, I mean, American literature uh, for English. So he did um, American Lit, looks like, that year. And then he did the History Channel. Family discussions do not underestimate the value of family discussions around the um, dinner table. History is a passion in this, in his family. Okay. So, you know, consumer math, again, this is like everyday math. And then he did business math. Hmm, what did he do there? Cashier, restaurant experience, currency exchange. By this time he's doing, you know, management position um, training in his job, managing purchases, monthly payments. Okay. So, He's doing all that. And then, and then we're going to get Phyllis on here. In Apple Core, we have a portfolio section. It's hardly ever filled out. And it is, 
I was a huge one with my kids. They have pages of portfolio entries that they have. It helped them get scholarships. It helped with job interviews. It helped with their military career. They had a record of everything. So here uh, we saw that he did ping pong in ninth grade and look, he won a ping pong competition and was awarded a gold ribbon. It was hosted by the Autistic Foundation and all proceeds. Okay, uh, computer programming, that was on his transcript, but the mom also uh, put, which actually was me, that this is my fake thing. And this mom actually didn't have anything in the portfolio, but I wanted you to see that she could have. I looked at his transcript and thought, I know this kid. Um, you know, so I put just a little bit about that programming and what he learned, because that is not going to show up on the transcript. What you put in there for the course description is not going to show up on the transcript, but you can put things like that in the portfolio. And then pretty soon you keep adding things and it's going to be a long list of things they were involved in, competitions they might have won or placed. Um, it's going to show their interest. You know, it might be whale watching off the coast of Maine. You know, it might be travels. It could be anything. But please, please. Um, and this is something that you would start in high school or junior high um, to start building that portfolio for them. Okay, so hope that gives you um, just a little insight to everything that we've got. And now, Phyllis, what have you got for us? I have, you know, we've, we've tried to give a lot of information here in a kind of a short amount of time. And we've given some really, uh, had some good conversation about the things you can do. Uh, and I want to, I want to try to help provide some tools. I think that's probably the gist of what I'm uh, going to talk about just a little bit about I've made a list uh, Diane's going to share this in um, I think maybe in the maybe the chat or the q and I'm not sure so we're going to share these links I've got uh, some good resources and links and just want to talk about some tools that you can use because um, you know you got if you're if you're just kind of starting out thinking about this and trying to figure out how in the world what is this going to look like how do I make this work for, for my family. Um, I, I think I've got some good tools for you. And so the, some of this is recommended reading. And honestly, um, some of these some of these books are so helpful because it kind of lets you um, see how other people have, have unschooled. And it uh, one of these, the first resource is the Unschooling Handbook by Mary Griffith. Um, it's, it's, uh, the second part of that title is how to use the world, the whole world as your child's classroom. And that's what this book does. It just kind of teaches you a little of, the, of an overall philosophy. And it also helps you learn to, uh, take everyday activities and put them into educational categories. And once you can kind of do that, you kind of breathe a sigh of relief because you start realizing, oh, we, you know, we really are doing educational things, even when we're playing, even when we're building a fort in the backyard, even when we're, you know, whatever we're doing, you tell me what you're doing, I'm just about pretty much every time give you an educational category or two uh, that, that these activities could fall into. And so it kind of helps you start to relax a little bit and see how this can work for you. And I really recommend that, uh, I recommend this book all the time, The Unschooling Handbook, How to Use the Whole World as Your Child's Classroom. Another really good one is by a lady named Terry Camp. She's a homeschool mom. We had her locally years ago come in and do a couple of workshops for us. She's fantastic. She wrote this book called Ignite the Fire. Freedom is Real Education. And this book gives you a lot of practical uh, ways to take whatever your kids are wanting to learn about and um, uh, ways to just like reinforce that and for them to practice that. Things like um, uh, making games, how, to, how, to, how your kids can make games about things that they're interested in. And so you end up having like Playing games is one of the best ways to learn, <clears throat> excuse me, because it, it just is. It's, it's fun and you just learn a lot playing games. 
and and so she teaches you to how to like coach your kids through you've got the subject matter that they're interested in hey guys make a game about this they learn a lot by making the game and they learn a lot by playing the game it's just a win-win all the way around there are lots of of ideas like that that she um that she gives and a lot of good encouraging philosophy also uh just to kind of help you stay encouraged and uh not feel like you're alone you know in this in this thing so it's a really good book also um another one i came across i haven't read this one myself yet but I really, I want to read this. I really like the sound of it. It's Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. I know this is going to be a good book. Um, Carrie McDonald is some is a name that's familiar to me. Uh, and so I, I feel like this is going to be a really good um, book, uh, you know, just about the unschooling style of education, hearing about educators that have left the public classroom and their thoughts on it and why it's so good entrepreneurs and innovators and, and people that really see this as a really beneficial way to learn. And so I think this is going to be a really good book. Um, this is one I just learned about last night and I've already done a little research on it and I'm fascinated. And uh, Lonnie gave me this one. It's Einstein never used flashcards how our children really learn. And this is a book um, and, and it says and why they need to play more and memorize less. Um, this is a book written by three PhDs. And um, in, in, you know, and in, in these ladies know what they're talking about. It's, it's just fascinating. There's even a YouTube link. I found a YouTube link. One of the authors is doing a lecture and basically like doing a presentation about this idea that, um, you know, we're kind of, we, we don't have a finite amount of knowledge in the world. If we did, it would be easy. We could just, you know, teach all the facts and then go about our business. But really the knowledge, everything has expanded so much. There's no way that someone can learn all the facts. There's no way it's not possible. Um, and so, um, you know, we're now in a, an age where we need to learn how to learn and um, not just memorize facts. And so she really, really believes these these ladies do, these folks that wrote, wrote this book in the value of play and how um, kids learn through play. Adults learn through play. You know, we, we all learn through doing things that are addressing our different, you know, learning styles, auditory, hands-on, you know, visual. Uh, when we're, when we're playing, we're usually having all of those things addressed, and it's just, um, anyway, it, this is a fascinating, it's a, it's a fascinating book, and the lecture, I think, is going to be just as good. I haven't finished it yet, uh, but, but I've got the link to that, too. Um, and go ahead, Lonnie, did you want to say something? Um, okay, I haven't looked at the link yet. Did you put, are we going to put the link to the online book? Because when I first, I ordered the book and I had it, but then I realized that I believe the entire book or part of it anyway. Am I right about that? It's, that online. it's online. I just, I, I just linked now. I just linked the Amazon link, but okay. if, if somebody searches for it, it, that's enough to at least get the title and people can even search for that. Um, and that's the way, kind of the way it is with all of these. I just put one link on there, uh, just enough to get the title out there to you. But um, yeah, look, that would be really cool if it was just online. You, you wouldn't have to remember now. Some of them something. are, so mm -hmm. you know, I think okay. you part of it online awesome. maybe. And then there are some resources that I personally used. Um, when I was schooling my kids, we did a lot of unschooling. We wouldn't unschool for a year and then traditional school for a year. We would unschool for a couple months and then I would get all nervous and we would get, get the workbooks out and we would do workbooks for a little while. And I would go, this is ridiculous. This is so dry. Nobody's getting anything out of it. And we'd go back to doing hands-on more, you know, interest-based, uh, unschooling. And, um, uh, it, it, but it was okay. You know, it, it worked for us. We were definitely that painting that Marta showed with all the different, you know, we were, we were all over the place, um, but it worked for us. And um, so I've got some tools and I give, I, I talk to a lot of parents that are looking for, 
you know, ways that their kids can um, learn about things that are, but, but do it in a kind of non-traditional way. And so I've, I've uh, found several things that I really like. One of them is the merit badge worksheets. The Boy Scouts of America publishes, puts their merit badge worksheets online. They're free. Um, I've shared a link um, here where there, you can get them in a PDF format and you can print off these worksheets and they're, it's every, um, you know, all of these merit badges that the Boy Scouts have, they're all educational, all of them. Um, and there's some for the social studies that would fall under social studies category. There are science, there are electives, there's auto mechanics, which I can honestly go just about any way you want to go with auto mechanics and some of those kinds of things. Um, and so anyway, what they do is they, uh, these, these um, worksheets will kind of give very broad assignments, basically go learn more and come back and tell us how this works. Um, you know, whether it's about animals or whatever, it, they're super, they're wonderful. And what it does is it says, okay, you're kind of interested in this area, go learn some stuff about, you know, this, you know, about this topic and come back and, and uh, you know, fill in your worksheet. And it's, it's an awesome way to, and good for multi-ages, um, it's, ex it, it's like hands-on, you, a lot of it is, um, actually doing stuff, not just going and reading, but going and reading to learn, and then doing some things to try it out, just like ex experiment type things, and it's very activity-based. I love the Merit Badge worksheets. There's a large variety of them, and, um, I, I, I think they're fantastic. Um, Can I add something um, yeah. here? Because we were talking about the portfolio, and I know that one mom has already commented on that, that thank you so much, my son will love this. Um, but this is the kind of thing that if you've got a student in junior high or high school and they decide to do these merit badge, you know, activities and mm -hmm. complete those, this is very much something that they're not only learning about certain things that you can give credit for um, on their transcript, but this is the kind of thing that's going to go in their portfolio. You know, they might not have a Boy Scout troop and they can't really earn their Eagle Scout, but when colleges look at that on the activities that you're filling out for their, um, you know, their college admissions or scholarships, they're looking for things like this and an Eagle Scout um, in getting that, earning your Eagle Scout badge um, is huge, huge. Mm -hmm. And so this is something you can put in the portfolio. You know, if your son is doing these, you can awesome. list things like that mm -hmm. in the portfolio. And, you know, um, colleges like Harvard, you know, let's just talk about this whole unschooling with the elite colleges. Why do colleges like Harvard, they are going to pick schools who, I mean schools, they're going to pick students who um, did very project-based learning, like Boy Scouts, like some of these things. And why is that? Because they know that that's how kids learn to think. Mm -hmm, right. You know, they're doing projects. So again, the unschooling approach, um, you can very much kind of go with the whole project-based learning, you know, which you, is you actually one of the best things you yeah. can do. You remember things better when it's connected to other things. And so that's why the project-based or unit study type, you know, you, you pick a subject and you just, you know, start exploring because what you learn is connected to something that you already know. And so it just, it just sticks better. And so that's, that is why it's so effective. Exactly. I've got a, I've got a link in here for a, a little workbook with reproducibles called grocery cart math. That's really fun. It's, it's not something that you sit down and drill on every day. It's, you know, when, when my kids had three kids that would have to go to the grocery store with me every week. And so I had to have something for everybody to do or else, and they were going, probably going to be some spankings before we left out of there. So I would make um, copies of age appropriate, you know, there's different levels in this little book, activities for them to do in the grocery store that are math related, measuring, uh, comparing prices, uh, some very uh, other, other uh, um, things that are very, very simple. Um, think some things that are more complex, you know, you get to thinking about, um, 
discounted prices and uh, which is really the best buy and just things, things like that. It's just full of activities that you can do at the grocery store. And that's a perfect go along for an unschooling family, uh, especially on grocery store day. Um, and then, you know, uh, talking about project based um, learning, unit studies are perfect for that. And you, you know, you, the, the thing about unschooling is you can use anything as your tool. You can use a structured a curriculum like a Becca as your tool if, if you're an unschooling family is you just what you don't do is you don't let the curriculum be your master okay you're using it as your tool you're not becoming a slave to the curriculum and so unit studies are the same I've seen families and I've been there where I, I, we were doing a unit study it's supposed to be all fun and and uh, I was I was killing the joy right out of it because I you know wanted it done you know I was just had so many requirements and I really learned that uh, the unit study is an awesome place to to start and some of these some of these companies have unit studies that are already put together for you the research is done the um, suggestions are already there the supplemental reading list and vocabulary list is all there for you so you don't have to do all of that um, and it's a great it's a great way to just kind of um, you know, have a jumping off place. And so uh, I've, I've listed a couple of links. There are lots of unit study ideas. If you just Google it, homeschool unit study ideas, you'll find a bunch. Uh, but one of them, one of my favorite ones is unitstudy.com by Amanda Bennett. Uh, she has unit studies for all grade levels from kindergarten through high school. And they're all, uh, you pick, you pick, you choose them by subject. You know, there's the baseball one, there's horses, and there's different animal ones and oceans and ships and all kinds of things. And they, you know, by kind of doing it, if you're new to unschooling, sometimes you can start with a unit study and just kind of get a feel for how it can work, how educational it really is when you pick something that the kids are interested in and you see how you can do language and you, you you can pull in some math, you can pull in science and history and all of this stuff. So it's a kind of a good um, way sometimes just to kind of get a feel for for some more unstructured, more natural type of learning. Um, five in a row is another one that I just, it's a literature based, you know, you, you, you take these really wonderful little books and you read them and then based on what is talked about in the story, there are activities that you do and it just, it just brings the learning alive. It's wonderful, but there are lots of unit study ideas out there. I just shared a couple in case you, you don't know what they are. Um, another, another really cool uh, thing that I like to share with families is uh, it's a, actually a curriculum. It's called Movies as Literature. Um, it's just an out of the box way to, um, you know, be exposed to literature and literary, you know, study. And, um, and so anyway, I've included a link about that. It's kind of a uh, non-traditional way of, of doing some literature. Um, another idea is just kind of a thing for science. Um, nature study is fantastic for science and you could do really could do nothing but nature study for years and have a fantastic foundation for any kind of science that you want to go into. And so I've shared uh, just one uh, link about how to start a nature journal with kids. Um, if, if everybody, mom, and, mom included or parents included, has a nature journal, that, you know, when you go out and, and go for a walk uh, once or twice a week or however every day, however often you do it, everybody just kind of gets into the routine of grabbing their nature journal and carrying it along because you never know what you're going to see that you, you might, you might want to stop and sketch something or do a rubbing and then come back and identify it or there's just so many ways to bring nature study in uh, to, to your experience and it doesn't feel like school to kids they're they're you know seeing things that interest them in the moment and then lo and behold they're learning more about it later on or you're talking about it at supper or or whatever so I've included one link about starting a nature journal there's lots of info out there about that that you can look up I also found a really good um the knotgrass company the knotgrass people are they're lifestyle learning people. They, they have always um, 
they've always encouraged the lifestyle, a lifestyle of learning. And they have got um, a part on their website. It's a, they call it homeschool history. Uh, and it's actually homeschoolhistory.com. Um, and I, they shared it on their website. I don't know if it's their link or if it's somebody else's, they just share it on their website. But that's where I found this one, homeschoolhistory.com. It has got videos and um, all kinds of stuff. If you're, if you're run across something that's historical and you kind of want to know more about it or your kids do, you go in there and you look and, and you'll find videos and, and all kinds of things. Uh, it's just a great all around resource for history. Um, so we've got that link. I always encourage a timeline. Um, you, you don't have to study history in a linear fashion. You can study history just as you come to it. Um, history is not one of those studies. Math, you kind of have to do things in order. History, not so much. You can, uh, but, and so if you have something like a timeline, you can, as you come across things, uh, like you, maybe you're doing a field trip and you see something really interesting, you're, you're like, we have the Pink Palace in Memphis, there's lots of cool stuff there, and you you see something really interesting, maybe you, you take it back and go back and, and put something on your timeline about when the, when the Piggly Wiggly store was started. And uh, anyway, you start putting things on your timeline as you come to them. And over a period of time, <clears throat> excuse me, you start seeing how things kind of overlap with each other. Um, and, and history starts to get connected. You, you start making history connections too. And all of a sudden, you're able, history starts making more sense. It's not just memorizing dates and names of people that, you know, you, you, you don't even really know who they are. As you're reading biographies or historical fiction or, you know, doing some really good reading of some awesome books, you run across things that you think, you know, let's, let's put this on our, on our timeline and you start putting these things on your, on the timeline. It's amazing what a timeline will do. And there are all different ways to do one. Um, I've, I've put in a couple of different links. There are, sometimes you can, you can buy a timeline that's kind of already put together. you all it needs is for you to put in the, the events or you can do it yourself. You know, some people have their, their wall is just a big, long timeline. It's really cool. Um, uh, so I put in a couple of links for that. Um, Another thing that goes along with the timelines is maps. Uh, you want to have, we, uh, we always had a, an outline map that we, uh, we had laminated, a big one we put on the wall, one of the United States, and then a different one of the world. And as we would put things on the timeline, we might also label it on the map of where it took place. And then again, as you get more and more things on your timeline and on your map, it's really cool how it all starts to come together and make sense. And this is not something that you do in a week and your timeline's done and your map is done. This is something that stays up, that as you go through the years, you continue to put things on there. It's really awesome how that, how that kind of works and, and things start to come together for everybody. Um, notebooking is a really cool method too, to just, um, I've seen families who uh, like notebooking became the method of, uh, uh, you know, kids, I want you to just, you know, your only assignment really is to start some notebooks. I don't care what they're about. They can be about anything you want them to be about. I've seen families use this so successfully. Um, and so uh, I've put a couple of links about notebooking there too, that, it, you know, if that resonates with you at all, you would really uh, find some really good stuff there. Lap booking is another one that allows you to take whatever you're learning about and kind of put it into, uh, you, you make uh, these folders and you end up kind of displaying uh, by drawing pictures or there's just so many different ways to do this. But it's very, very um, good for kind of displaying, recording what you've learned. You know, a lot of um, the, the art of strewing we've already talked about, so I won't go into that again, but I've put a couple of links about strewing. Um, you know, a lot of times what you, what people worry about is record keeping. How am I going to keep up with what we've learned? How am I going to, you know, we're not, if we're not using a curriculum. How do I know what we've learned? How do I, how do I do that? And so um, a couple of suggestions that I have for that is that one of the things I did, because I definitely got into the 
into the, like, I got discouraged thinking, I don't think we've done anything. You start to get scared, you know, start to panic. We haven't done anything. We're having a great time, but I don't know anything that we've done. And so I started just at the end of the day, I would take just a notebook and I would just go, okay, here are the things we did today. And then I would, because I had read the unschooling handbook and some of the other things like that, I would go, okay, wait, that's, that could be English language arts. Um, when we did our read alouds and we talked about that and all that, we did some copy work and, and uh, you know, the, the, everything that we did, I was able to put into educational categories and I would date it. And it, it was, it really helped me a lot. And I could, over time, I could look back and kind of see all the different, it's kind of like a scope and sequence in reverse. Um, it was very helpful to me uh, to, to kind of have that. And then something a little more uh, formal, a little, a, a little less do it yourself is uh, a, it's called a record of the learning lifestyle that the not grasses have put together. They have put it together and it's uh it's been available for a long time. It's on, the, on their website, and I've linked that, too. So it's a record of the learning lifestyle. It just is a, it's a book, um, a notebook kind of a thing where they just, it's set up to, for you to be able to put your notes in there, and um, it ends up kind of giving you a record so that you can feel better, so that you can kind of look back and kind of have a record and, uh, um, you know, use that to, to document, you know, what you've done and put grades into Apple Corps or whatever. And so anyway, I think some of these um, are, might be helpful, you know, some, hopefully some of these resources you'll find helpful. And um, uh, anyway, there are lots and lots more, um, but yeah, that's, that's my part. And I, I'm, I'm uh, glad to be here with you guys today. Uh, Phyllis, when you were talking, I thought about so many things, but one of the things I'm thinking about right now is your new little puppy. <laughs> That's what you hear. Oh, you no. Know, it made me start thinking about the fact that when we homeschool, you know, it kind of seems like moms are always calling us up because their kids are behind because life happened you know this happened and this mm -hmm. happened and oh my gosh now we're behind and so you know I would always say wait a second wait 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 um what happens in life should not be pulling you away from your homeschooling but no. it should that is your homeschooling right now you're not behind they're exactly. learning exactly what God wants them to learn, whether it is a sick grandparent that has come to live with you or some kind of a physical exactly. problem, maybe with one of the kids. Well, that is what you are learning. And so when you unschool and you just right. kind of have that uh, mindset that life mm -hmm. is not here in this compartment and then our school is here. You know, because then life's always mm -hmm. going to be getting in the way. But if you look at it like this is our home, this is mm -hmm. our school, this is our life, and it's all our learning, and it's all very natural, you know, learning. And so when something happens, then you don't look at it like, oh my goodness, now we're not finishing our curriculum. But it's like Phyllis said, your curriculum does not own you. Right. You know, that doesn't mean you can't get a credit in that biology or, or something because you got sick. Well, now we're going to switch gears and we're going to finish up with that is the rest of our biology curriculum is dealing with this illness in our bodies and all this stuff, you know, so you're a puppy, you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh, see, that <laughs> is such a learning thing. What do you learn you know, yes. I mean, yes. we have high schoolers who get the animal science credits, remember, like the guy with the, um, the lizard, you know, herpetology. Yes. So all these things, instead of always thinking, oh my gosh, this puppy takes up so much time and he's such a distraction. Well, no, no, this is, you know, this is part of our educational experience now. And, and you learn all these different things <laughs> with puppies, that's for sure. But let's answer some of these questions now. So Diane has answered all but three. Awesome job, Diane. 
So how do you figure out if you're doing enough? My kids hate curriculum. How do I get structure while unschooling? So we can all just kind of have some input on that if we want. And I will say I've done a lot of studies over the years with the structure versus unstructure. Now, um, they psychologists have learned that kids actually learn more doing unstructured than structured activities. That's where the learning takes place. So there's a real balance there. And if they hate curriculum, you know, um, let them learn in ways that they love learning. We've got all the learning styles on our website as well. Um, you know, so if you've got um, kids that say they're very uh, visually, you know, oriented as far as their learning style. Let them watch a lot of documentaries and movies. Um, take them to museums where they can do things. And all kids love hands-on, you know. So let them learn in this very, you know, natural style. Let them do the projects. Let them do, um, now I will say in the spring, uh, that's when a lot of moms and students get very discouraged and they just want to quit. And I get that because I'm a real spring person. So, you know, what we would do is switch gears because uh, we would be tired of being indoors at that point. And so it's like, okay, you know what? Let's do projects now. Let's uh, do a garden. Let's be outside. Let's, you know, you, all these kinds of things that you can take advantage of the weather and the seasons and, you know, doing things. So the spring is a really good um, time to switch gears to like a project. Let's do some projects here. And, you know, you can have a little structure to your day. I remember we would try to start out with Bible, you know, start out with our kind of a devotional time. We just had a kind of a, a general structure to our day. We start out with, with devotion time and Bible and, um, we did a lot of read. I, I read aloud to my kids all the way until they were like head jobs and weren't there for me to read to them. And so we, we always did read aloud time. And during that time, they were allowed to do puzzles or Legos or flips on the floor. I didn't care what they did as long as I knew they were listening and could kind of repeat back what, you know, let, let me know if I would check in with them and say, okay, what just happened? If they could tell me that then that was, that was fine, that they could do whatever they wanted to. And so we kind of develop, you, you kind of, you just, you don't start out with a real schedule, but you, you'll kind of develop your rhythm. Um, and, you know, before, before you know it, it's lunchtime. And then, you know, you've got karate, you know, and, and different things, different activities. And, you know, half the time we would wake up in the morning and if it was going to be a real pretty day, we're not that far from the zoo. We might just go, let's go to the zoo today. And then that would be an all day field trip. You know, we're doing all sorts of awesome things that way. So you, you can kind of get your rhythm, um, but you know, you don't, and, and that's okay to do that. Uh, it's not against the rules, you know, to have a little bit of a, you know, block, block schedule, sort of a rhythm for your day. So um, you just kind of have to play with it. You have to be willing to experiment with it. And there are going to be some days that you're going to go, this is not working for me. And so, okay, so then you regroup and you read a little more, do a little more research and, and uh, try something different the next day and you'll figure it out. Just be patient with yourself and patient with your kids. One of the things that I didn't like, I didn't like my kids playing video games. It just kind of made them not be interested in anything. And so we wouldn't do that, but anything else that they wanted to do pretty much was, you know, we, we, I would go with that. And it's not, you know, I mean, you, you just, you have to experiment with it and be willing to experiment. Can't, can't hear you. Unmute. I have to unmute two spots. Can you hear me now? Oh, I want to speak to the idea of, am I doing enough? How do I know if I'm doing enough? And I want to go back. I tried to talk about this a little bit before, and I don't think I finished my thought, but there will always be gaps in education. You probably, like Phyllis talked about, we can't teach every bit of knowledge that is out there. Kids who go to public school with a super structured situation don't mesh with that teacher, or they don't like that textbook and they have gaps 
gap, sometimes big gaps. One thing I've heard over and over this year is people whose kids were in public school and then they closed the school and then they just said, okay, you're in 10th grade when you were in ninth grade last year and they didn't finish stuff. There will always be gaps. The beauty of unschooling or relaxed homeschooling places on this side of the spectrum is that you teach them to learn and they will learn. And if they really want to learn a specific thing, they'll really learn that thing. So don't, um, it's a really hard thing for a mom because you want to give your kids your bet the best, but don't sweat that. I don't, I don't know, know a practical way to say it, but I say it from a mom's heart to a mom's heart. Don't sweat. Did I do enough? Um, and you know what? Sometimes honest guys, let's just say it relationships between parents and children, parents, children may come to you and say, you didn't do enough. That is a real thing. <laughs> but if you taught them to learn, in my mind, and in much of the research, you did a lot. And as much as a public school, probably way more. You, you're always going to feel that. You're always going to feel that. Did I do enough? And I don't care if you use a super high, hardcore curriculum, or if you let your kids play video games all day, you're always going to say, did I do enough? Did I do it right? So you kind of got to get used to living there, for one thing. <laughs> you got to pray a lot. And you really do have to trust the research that says, teach them to learn and they will learn. They will continue to learn and they will love to learn. That's, that's such a key part. Yeah, that's but great. We're, we're all in this, t we all feel that way. Please know, we all feel that way. You know, and the thing that you touched on, Marta, is that uh, we as homeschool moms tend to um, really feel guilty um, and we feel totally responsible for the success or failure of our students, you know, our kids that get out into the world and we're like, we tend to put ourselves under condemnation, but, um, but, you know, you just got to get all that out of your head, you know, and know that when you homeschool in a very real and a very relaxed way, that you are giving your child the best opportunity to learn you know, and it's a real education. It's not just some kind of a fake we're going through the motions because when it comes down to it, God doesn't like that. He wants our hearts. He doesn't like going through the motions. And so when we homeschool, it was just the way for me to not go through the motions because I didn't want that. I didn't want my kids to even learn that that was the way to go through life. Everything was just real. You know, and if you feel like, uh, okay, all they're doing is playing. Well, the reality is, is that there's books on play and that's the way kids learn. So you just kind of write that day off and go, you know what? It was not wasted. They played all day. They had fun. They learned, you know? And so what if, now this is a real thing too, is that I know, I know teenage boys and they love video games. So, you know, that's something that moms nowadays have to struggle with. Are they learning anything? Well, I went through the same thing with my kids. I did not want any of that, but it came. It came into our house. Uh, they started playing the whole video games. Well, I've got the advantage of being able to look back now. Two boys in the Air Force. One's a captain. One's a major. They do all this. Uh, and, and I had to look back and go, you know what? They learned a lot of this stuff through their video games that I hated and I did limit them. But, you know, a lot of what they did was learning about the military, learning about war, doing all this stuff. And they Fine learned motor skills, yes, eye hand coordination. Exactly. <laughs> they learned all this stuff. They, they did all the building civilizations and all that. So I did make sure you know, to the best of my ability, that they were good learning video games. Um, so you can monitor that. But, you know, when it came down to it, they learned history. A lot of their history, they did learn through video games. So that was just something they, they did love and they did learn it. So again, don't condemn yourselves. But, you know, we can, we definitely do as moms kind of limit and then the other thing that I wanted to say about the whole structure thing is that when I learned to go with my kids' rhythms 
um, for structure instead of my own, things went much smoother. So I learned that when my kids woke up in the morning, not to immediately pull them away from what they were doing um, to what I wanted them to do, because then kids are going to resist. If you're constantly pulling them away from what they want to do to what you want them to do, they're going to resist. So I really started going with uh, what they were doing. And as long as they were doing something constructive, my daughter would be reading, my sons would be building, connects, Legos, robotics, whatever it was that were going to be building something. And once I realized how uh, productive that was, and they both went to engineering schools, but I thought early on, what if they go to an engineering school and I'm pulling them away from all this, you know? So I just said, okay, you know what? You're doing something very constructive. Look, you're reading your, the directions. It was a new Connects space station or something. And they're working together and they're building this that I don't think I could have built. So I thought, well, what if I just let you do this until you're ready for something else? Now I have to say my sons looked at me like, uh, where is my mom? What have you done with her? You know, because I had to learn how to do this. And I had been very structured. School starts at nine, you know. Um, but I got out of that and I let them start doing their things. Now you can tell when they're ready for something else because they're going to start getting antsy. They're going to start looking around the house for something. They're going to start fighting and arguing, right? And that's when you go, hey, let's do math. You know, um, and then you get them into something structured because they are ready for that then. And as they get into high school, they're going to be ready for more and more structure. But when they're little, you know, it's going to be maybe let's do 15 minutes of your math workbook, you know. Um, so, so that's one thing that is going to help with that whole resistance is that you are, you're structuring according to your family. How do we roll in our family? Let's go with that always, instead of always, you know, like battling this. So that's a lot too of the philosophy of unschooling, you know, that interest led and with the schedules of the unstructured versus structured. So you learn and don't condemn yourself because someone else's family is not your family. And you might not really know how their daily structure goes, <laughs> you know, let's, okay, so. So let's see, this one is, I love the idea of the relaxed homeschooler. That's kind of how I lean, I guess my question is how to bring the topics your child does, does not naturally gravitate towards and making sure they stay on track in those topics. For instance, mine is obsessed with science, a great reader, but he puts up a lot of resistance with math. And we do see that math is the one course. Now, let me just say mine and then y'all jump in. Math is one of those things where they say, why do I have to learn this? And I would say, well, just because you have to learn that you need to do things in life that you don't enjoy. You think I love doing dishes? You think I love changing diapers? No, but I learned those things. Math teaches you, you have to learn things you don't enjoy, right? But the other thing when my daughter got to, you know, algebra or algebra two, she's like, mom, why do I have to do this? I'm never going to have to do this. She wanted to be an education major, which she's a teacher now. And she knew one math course in college was all she was going to need. Why do I have to do algebra two? And I said, well, because algebra teaches you how to problem solve. You know, and she had also done the whole, no one is ever going to ask me how to solve an algebra problem in real life, right? And I said, well, that's true. But, and I think this had to be God inspired because I'm not that smart. But I said, you know, you're going to have real problems in life and they're going to be hard. And it's going to seem like they are unsolvable, but they are impossible. But remember with algebra, I would take them when we did algebra to the very last page in the book on the very first day and say, hey, can you solve this problem? And they would look at that problem and say, oh, oh, no, that's impossible. You can't solve a problem with that many unknowns and everything. And I said, well, we're going to learn how to do it. 
but it's the same way that God teaches us how to problem solve is step by step. You know, it's how you eat elephants, it's how you climb a mountain. And so I just told her, algebra is going to teach you how to do that. And I actually got rewarded when she was in college. I never knew the problem, but she said, you know what, mom, I had a problem that seemed to me like it was impossible to solve. And you know how I did it? I thought about algebra and I thought, I know how to do this. It's step by step. That's how God leads us. And I can do this. And I did it. And I thought, oh my gosh. So sometimes math is one of those things where if they just hate it, you can get math programs that kind of go with their style. But the bottom line is going to be sometimes we have to do things we don't like. That's life. So let's just, let's just change our mindset here. <laughs> Let me say on on um, the with a with a relaxed homeschooler, the mom is still or the dad or uh, the family member that's um, taking on that role is still giving some direction. I will tell you that there are unschoolers who would say, if your kid doesn't like math, don't do math. I'm going to tell you that is a real thing, and that's scary to some people. Um, it's and I'm one of those people. I would I would struggle with that. I, I would tell you I would be more leaning like what Lonnie is saying. But um, when you hear um, the video that I, I mentioned, a young man that was a unschooler, uh, and he there are some very radical homeschoolers uh, unschoolers on that video. There is a woman who talks about she never taught her kids math. The math that they learned came from life, and those kids went to college she on their transcripts she took real life things to count for their math they went to college and they tested pretty well and you guys know that there's a very high percentage of kids who go through public school homeschool curriculums and go to even community college and have to do the remedial math so you know it, it's kind of a a lot of like what we keep saying is you have to feel it out with your child and you have to feel it out with yourself. Am I going to force that? Or am I, what is my choice there? What is my philosophy there? Um, but there's research out there that says there's some kids don't let my hit kids hear me say this because they have suffered through some math for me. But there are kids who don't do math curriculums and they do well. They, they, their brain has figured out math from some other way. And people historically, like, you know, Euclid jumps in the, in the, or in, in the bathtub and says, Eureka, I don't think he went through a, a specific math curriculum. So I'm, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit because I'm not pr preaching what I practice, but I'm preaching what I do know to be true for some families. And if that's you, we want to say to you that you have that flexibility to find ways to show your math through stuff you did in life with your child or someone else, you know, a grandpa or somebody. It, it does happen, guys, it does happen. And so don't be afraid. If you are leaning that way um, and you research it and you feel strongly about it, it, there's a lot of resources out there to encourage you in that. Games are really good for math, too. It doesn't have to be like a math game yes. where you yes. add, you know, where it's, you know, it it doesn't even have to look like a math game necessarily. It's card games. I, I've got a sister-in-law who comes from a really big family. They come out of Iowa is where she grew up. And so they were a farming family. It's not like they, you know, were descended from Harvard graduates or anything. They were just simple people. But those those folks loved to play poker, I think is what they mainly played. And they and pinochle and just the card games. And they are some of the most math bright people you will ever meet. And so they learned early on their their brain learned how to be logical and deal with numbers because they're playing cards. And so cards and, and board games and things like that, you can sneak math in that way. Um, and also, you know, if you're just learning life skills, then you're going to be learning some math. You're going to be learning about the calendar. You're going to be learning about time management. Hopefully, we'll all learn to tell time. Um, you know, all of that is math. And, um, you know, as kids get 
older, it becomes more complex just because life becomes more complex, you know, um, budgeting and things like that. That's all math. And so you can sneak it in in a lot of ways if you, if you feel like you need to do that. If you can't, you know, get them to do a, something traditional. One of the moms said Monopoly, which is great. You know, all board games. We did Yahtzee. We did Dominoes. I'm doing Dominoes right now. I play with my two-year-old grandson. Dominoes um, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And oh my goodness. Um, so we did games a lot. And, you know, when they were little, their very favorite thing, and this lasted all the way through my grandkids. Um, they homeschooled. And they, they're total unschoolers, you know. But um, we had a jar of all the different kinds of dried beans, you know, like you make the soup with the 15 beans. I poured some of those into a quart jar and they would beg, beg to play with that jar. All my kids, all my grandkids, dump them out, sort them, count them. They learned everything in, uh, uh, you know, as far as their elementary math. Um, all about just everything with those beans. And that's the thing where we're a facilitator, Marta, you know, which I love that. We're not the teacher as much as we are the facilitator. We sit back and we watch our kids and then we go, hey, you know what else you can do? And you show them something new. And then they do that. And then you show them something new. Instead of counting all these, you know, you can group them and say, how many groups of three do I have? And bam, multiplication, you know. So yes, math very much. And then again, in high school, you know, it's up to you, the mom, if you know you're on that lifestyle because you have a farm and your kids are going to farm or they're going to be doing these things that don't involve a four-year college or even a two-year then you do not have, like the kid I showed, he never did um, anything. He did do like a pre-algebra practical math. This is as far as he got, you know, um, my kids actually, they all wanted to go to college though, four-year college. So I'm like, well, they're going to be, you know, it, it's kind of like, what do your kids to get where they want to be? And for my kids to get where they want to be, they had to get at least through the algebra too, or I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, okay, really for what you want to do, let's do this. So you've got that freedom to do that. Um, okay, so how do we give grades when we follow this kind of a, let's put it together ourselves? How do we give grades there? And, you know, one of the things I tell moms is, well, how do you give a PE grade? you know, or music or art or a work experience when you don't know how they're doing or a driver's ed grade. We're looking at how they're doing. You know, we're getting the feedback. We know what they're learning and what they're not learning. We know what they know. Even if you have taken it to the extreme of no test, um, all natural learning, which some unschoolers do, I didn't do that. You know, um, I, you know, I, I kind of was, um, like Marta said, I wasn't quite mid-spectrum, but, you know, I did, a, because we had a co-op group and they had assignments and, you know, we did this stuff, structure and unstructure, but, um, you know, so they did have grades, but some of our moms, um, for example, what about the kid who is doing animal science? because he raises animals and he does all this stuff and he learns all this and he loves animal books and he loves videos, but you never had him sit down and take a test, but you know, he knows everything about animals. He's like an expert, you know? Um, how do you know? Well, you know, they love it and they know everything about it. That is an A. You know, there's just no doubt about that. So what do y'all have to say about that? Yeah, if I always would, um, you know, it, I would think along these lines, an A is excellent, a B is above average, a C is average, a D is below average. And so I would assign grades like that sometimes. And to me, uh, you know, you can test what, what your students know by 
seeing the projects that they make or uh, my kids loved doing videos and stuff. And so I, I, I could, they demonstrate what they know either through conversation with you. You can pro- usually have a conversation with your, with your child and know what they, what they, you know, what they have learned. And um, it's not so much about the subject matter that they've learned about is have they, have they put forth a decent effort? Have they, um, you know, applied themselves? There are a lot of things that I like to enter into how I grade when I'm doing this. You'll have to decide, you know, each, each, each person has to kind of decide what all things are important to you um, when you're using, it's very subjective. And so you have to just get comfortable with, you know, what, what are your priorities? What's important to you and give a grade based on that and just kind of keep those general categories in mind. A is excellent. B is above average. C is average and B is below average. That's the way I did it. And I'll add just to uh, agree with everything you guys have said. I don't know if I shared this quote before, but I like this quote and I think it's, um, it fits here. Dr. Raymond Moore said, you can tell if it is a, uh, if it's a good quality learning environment by who's asking the questions. Is your child still asking questions about it? Are they still um, learning about it? And there's other ways to uh, evaluate learning than a test. So like Phyllis said, seek out those ways that, that are comfortable for your family and that make sense. And is, is that curiosity growing? There's probably one good way. And here's another thing. I don't know if this is really what the question was about, but I think this is a helpful thing to understand. I think as homeschoolers, we want to sh- have integrity. We don't want to say, oh, my child finished um, some course. <laughs> I can't think of a good example, but some course. And, and then you're thinking, I don't know if they really did. One good way, and, and we as counselors always share this with people, so you all may already know this, but about you know around 150 hours in a school year, means that you've really covered a topic. You've spent probably a good 45 minutes to an hour a day during the school year on that topic. And so that is kind of comforting to me to know that if I'm not using a book, if I'm not using an online curriculum, this is another way you could say, I feel justified that we have studied this and studied it worth a credit. So that's another thing to think about. You could give a half credit, you can give a quarter credit, but, um, you know, logging the amount of time. And, and again, that's kind of hard, but think back to that journaling that uh, Phyllis talked about. When you're writing down at the end of the day, you can say 35 minutes with science, you know, and, and you can kind of um, help, let that help you gauge grades. Yeah. And the thing that I thought about too was that I did not want to set my children up for failure. None of us do. We don't want to give them an idea that they are an A student in math when we know we're, they're not, you know, because then the real world's going to hit them in the face at some point. So I always would kind of think if they were in school, what would their work, you know, how would they be graded? And I wanted them to, you know, not think they were an A student if they're not. But Since I deal with a lot of seniors, let me just tell you this, moms, because we tend to be harder on our own children than anyone else. Even if they're in a class, which my kids were in classrooms, I had other kids in our co-op, and I was always harder on them, right? Other other kid could give me an excuse, but my kids couldn't, right? So I made the mistake like some of our moms do, um, and I gave my daughter... I'm thinking like a B plus in geometry and I think algebra too. I taught math and uh, she never let me forget that because they were the only, you know, less than A she ever made. She aced college at the very top of her class. You know, she's like number two in her class. Um, She never let me forget that and said, mom, why did you do that? I mean, I, I, you know, she was, she was on the brink where I would have given any other student an A, But I did not want her to think she was an A student in math when I thought she was going to get to college and really not be an A student. But she was an A student. She aced it. So, you know, sometimes we have moms that when we're, you know, dealing with scholarships for their kids, the moms will say, oh, you know, can I go back in and change some of these grades? Because now I'm realizing I was way too hard on him. And, you know, sometimes you think, oh, is that unethical? But so I'm just going to say on the front end, like going into high school, 
try to, um, you know, you don't want to be too lenient. You don't want to be too hard on your kids. But the perception is that homeschool moms just give all A's. You know, the reality is, is that most of our kids do do all A work. Um, but we're very hard on our children because we, no matter what our philosophy, we have this expectation that we want our best. So I would look at that too with the kids, um, you know, and be a little bit harder on them if I knew they could do better, but they were just not giving me their best, you know. Um, so it's very subjective, but you do want to just be honest, not too easy and set them up for failure, not too hard and go, oh my goodness, um, <laughs> I should have given an A there. So then our last is how do you balance different age group learners? I have a seven-year-old and four-year-old girls, seven and four-year-old girls. I think this is really fun. Uh, you, you know, you, you can do almost everything together, especially if you're, if you're kind of unschooling, um, you know, you just, you, your, your younger one, everybody can be learning about the same stuff, the same topic, but maybe your seven-year-old is gonna, um, you know, go a little deeper or maybe have more responsibility or, you know, the vocabulary that, you know, the things that she's learning is going to probably have a little more detail um, than the four-year-old. But, you know, if they're both, in, if you can get them interested in kind of the same things, it's so fun for them and for you to be able to do school together. It's very natural. They live together. They play together. Um, let them do school together. Math is going to be a little different. And that's fine, you know, take 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe for the seven-year-old, maybe, uh, to focus on their specific level of math. And your four-year-old probably, you're probably going to, you know, at some point, they'll start learning to read, or maybe they'll read on their own. Who knows? Um, you play all of that by ear. There's no hard and fast rule. But it's, it is a super, super fun, very uh, family-building um, activity to do school all together like this. It really builds relationship. And to me, that's the number one thing about homeschooling anyway, is the relationships. So it's, you, you just got a gold mine there. It's going to be so fun. Older kids also, um, they enjoy teaching their younger siblings. And while some families, kids fight more than other families, and maybe that's a situation where, um, my kids really weren't big fighters, but they were talking the other day about how I had tried to get my oldest daughter to teach some of the younger ones piano. And that was a huge failure because that didn't go. But in some cases it will. And in other cases it did. She was always good at tutoring them for math. Um, so, you know, use your older child as, as another facilitator. That, that child might be the one that tells you, hey, mom, did you know, because you're not out there, she is really good at such and such and you didn't pick it up so um what a blessing that they have each other as well and and use them in those roles for each other and sometimes younger kids teach older kids stuff too and uh as Lonnie was saying earlier about the puppy one of the biggest pieces of wisdom I received as a homeschool mom way back when I had really little kids and ba still have babies and stuff was never look at your younger children as an interruption but look at them as the blessing from God that they are. And it's a very simple little statement and it's real hard to live, but man, carried it with me, never forgot it. And that is so true. So true. Oh, that, that is awesome right there. I actually um, had to counsel a, a young mom who had five children, ages kindergarten and below. And she was um, at the Nashville curriculum fair one year. Um, she'll know if she's listening, but she was so um, stressed and just ready to quit homeschooling. Like, how can I do this? The younger kids are always interrupting me and how can I even teach my kindergartner, you know, is what she was thinking. And I said, well, okay, you know what? Let's look at this a different way. Let's let them all do everything together. The young kids are not a not an interruption because you are going to be playing with all of them. And just like you said, you know, and then the kindergarten, you know, kindergartner, when it's nap time or something, spend that time 
you know, um, doing some phonics or doing some math in a math workbook, but everything else is just doing things with all your kids in a very natural learning environment. That's unschooling right there is doing everything together as a family. And, you know, my kids were, um, the boys were two years apart and then my daughter three years, you know, but they were kind of all right there. And so they could do almost everything together. And the reality is, is that the younger ones are going to learn things you would never, ever think to teach them in their curriculum. You know, they are going to be stretching up just by osmosis, just by being in that environment with, with older kids learning things. And they're just going to be playing along, but they're going to be catching it. You know, so my kids did grammar like that, for example. And, and, you know, another thing is songs. Oh, my gosh, kids learn everything through just fun songs. So we did action grammar and we had a little grammar tape that we would listen to in the van. Um, and that's how they learned their grammar. But, you know, just like we were talking about games when it came to grammar in particular, which we did not do out of books. We never we never did grammar. Well, I did with my older son. I did some of Becca and it just didn't work. Uh, it really didn't have the fruit. So we would, I would sit them down, we'd get in the den and whatever you can just, um, you know, depending on their age level, depending on what they're learning. But, you know, we did all kinds of things. If they were learning nouns, the older ones say, and the, all the parts of speech, I would make up a story or I would read them a story and say, okay, every time you hear a noun, raise your right hand, you know, and every time you hear a verb, raise your left hand, you know, and it would change every time, of course, and the, uh, and the little kids are following along, but they are learning that, you know, they don't have a clue, they're following it, and then pretty soon we turned around and fell down and everyone's laughing, that's how it always ended, you know, but we would just add more and more, and sometimes we would actually have paper and we would have like, um, you know, I'd throw in things like, uh, you know, get your blue color and write this. And, and, you know, so we would just do all kinds of things, but it was all fun and games. And they learned grammar <laughs> like that through the songs and through the action. And so your little ones, like my daughter, she would actually, when she was little, come and hide under the kitchen table while I was doing um math and logic and things like that with her older brothers because she was too little she was like whatever four or five years old and she would come and sit under the table and hide um so we were doing logic and you know I laid out the logic problem you know Mr. White did this and Mr. Green and you know you had to figure it up on paper and but I had read it out and now we were going to figure it out my daughter from under the table gave us the answer you know, it's Mr. White. What? And it was this child. And then, you know, that's how I realized her strengths, just like Marta was saying, you don't know. And then you start going, wow, because why? Because you're together and you're just doing this stuff and you're just kind of having fun. But think of what the kids are learning. I mean, they're really learning how to think, how to problem solve. And you know what? These are the leaders of tomorrow. It's not how well they do on their spelling tests. We never did spelling tests, by the way. Just want to throw that out there. Um, you know, we did spelling bees and all kinds of fun things, right? Um, but it, that's not going to be it. It's have they learned how to work in a group situation with all age groups? Have they learned how to problem solve? You know, have they learned how to be a leader and take these leadership positions when the problems look impossible, are they gonna be the one to go, uh, no, we can do this. That's what we want. That's what we got to have for tomorrow. So uh, again, I know all of us think this too. This is what we want for our kids. We don't want them just learning how to do problems in a curriculum book. Although you can use that, you can use anything, but we don't want to limit them to that. What have y'all got to say? And then we'll end this. Y'all want to say anything else before we end? Because this has been a pretty long uh, webinar, but hopefully I think our moms have, have really got a lot of information here. 
Yeah, I hope they've gotten a good, good and enough information to help them, uh, you know, be be interested in in this very natural way of, you know, raising your family. You know, it's not about school. So I mean, it's 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 school, but this is this is a way of life, and it's a an awesome way to to raise your family, really. Um, so. And we just hope you see our excitement about it and what a blessing it's been to us and that that might have encouraged you in your journey. And uh, we pray God's blessings. We pray for you guys all the time. So we pray that God will bless you as you try new things. That's awesome. Well, this has been really fun. And one of our moms, the last comment we've got is thank you all so much. I'm now unstressed. And that is always our goal to unstress our parents. Uh, so I think Jay's going to come back on now. We're going to end this. There will be a recording um, on Facebook. I don't know how else we do this, uh, but it's been awesome. And, um, and we really had fun doing this with you. So thanks for tuning in. Yes, indeed. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we should have the recording up by the end of the week. See you all next time.